Uh, the first home I went into that came out of the shelter, she worked two jobs in fast food. Um, she had two little girls, and there wasn't a blanket in that house. There wasn't a pillow. I just, and I just thought, how would they ever be okay? Like, how did they feel like people care about them sleeping on the floor? I'm sorry, that just really, kids deserve a bed. And, um, Hey, I'm Terry Crawford Brown. Uh, I'm from Richlands, Virginia. I, I'm a nurse and uh, a lifelong resident of Tazewell County, and I am the founder and president CEO of Blackberry Winter. I actually was an RN at 19 years old, which now I believe maybe should be against the law, but uh, so graduated high school early, got through nursing early, and then was working as an RN at 19. I was a labor and delivery nurse for about 12 years, then ER for years, then as a house supervisor for about 12 years, and now I have went way outside my comfort zone, and I am a travel nurse, and I am doing labor and delivery as a travel nurse. I have a lot of hobbies, but like, if you want my whole list, I'm trying to read all the Pulitzer Prize winners in fiction currently. I'm hiking all the highest peaks of the Appalachian Trail. I'm learning stained glass, which is the hardest thing I've ever tried to learn how to do, but I am improving on it. And I occasionally like to go CrossFit and lift weights and want to lift 500 pounds by the time I turn 50, which is in September. So, <laughs> and in my free time, I work full-time job and run a nonprofit, right? <laughs> occasionally forget to eat and sleep also. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was raised on Jewel Ridge, uh, on Bear Walla, called Reynolds Ridge, and uh, my two mamas and papas were next door neighbors. And then my parents were their children and they got married. And they have been like sweethearts since they were five. And both of my sets of grandparents thought the sun rose and set on me and the whole slew of the first cousins. So we lived a very magical childhood. Uh, we weren't allowed inside very much. Uh, we, I was allowed to watch one hour TV a day, and uh, we only had PBS and NBC, and you had to switch the antenna between the two to be able to watch either one of them. Uh, you know, my mom thought Dukes of Hazard was scandalous, so that wasn't, you know, anything we were allowed to watch. But I had all these first cousins and all these grandparents. Uh, we played ball on the mountain. We went to church on the mountain. We went to school on the mountain. We worked hard. We had big gardens. Um, we canned a lot of food. I, I can remember being six or seven years old and my papa was uh, crippled and um, him dressing me in that suit that you wear and smoking the honeybees so he could steal the honey. And I think back now and think, would we let a six or seven year old like rob the honeybees? You know, that is one of, the, one of my most favorite memories. Because, like, he was on crutches. He couldn't do it. And, uh, but so my childhood was just this magical childhood. But one thing I learned from my parents and my grandparents, and I, that no one in our area suffered alone. Uh, I read a thing one time that said, you know, my parents did drug me when I was a kid. They drug me to church. They drug me to the field. They drug me to the neighbors. They drug They did. Like, if uh, our neighbors were sick and their garden need hoed, we wouldn't hoed it. And I didn't want to, but I did. And my parents had foster kids. I mean, they lived what they believed, which is you, you help one another. But also, in our whole life, when we've needed help, people have helped us. Like, I, I don't even have to ask. I, my whole family had COVID when it was really first out and so bad and my husband was in ICU and he was very sick and people I hardly knew was bringing food to our house and leaving it on the porch, friends come taking our trash off, friends going and getting us medicine. Um, like I was just overwhelmed with the amount of help that we were given because all of us were sick, like the whole family, like there wasn't anyone that could go get something for us and everyone knew we were really having a hard time with Richard being so sick and um, 
Like anything like that in my life I can think of, and people showed up. And that's what I think Appalachia is. It, and I think that's how I was raised. That's what I was taught. That's why I taught my kids. It's hard when you know someone is having a hard time to come because it's painful to be with someone in hardship, but it is the most important time to be. All the other doesn't matter. When you show up when someone's hurting, sad, struggling, they always remember that. I always remember who showed up when I was having a hard time. So that, I think, is Appalachia. I think that is our culture. And I also think it's why Blackberry Winter is so successful. In a larger sense, Blackberry Winter is a time in the late spring when there's a cold snap. And it, um, it's when the blackberries are blooming. And my mama always used to tell me that it made your blackberry um, fruit more healthy and hearty when you had a cold snap in the spring. That saying and that meeting, first of all, it's just such a beautiful representation of Appalachian language and the way that things are said. And second of all, I love that, that hard times are what builds us. They're what make us strong. And they're, I mean, the hard times in my life are what has helped me have so much empathy and to know that I can help other people if I had had an all easy life, I don't know that I would have felt that same way. So I tell all the people we help, you know, we don't, you don't have to feel guilty for needing help. We don't expect anything from it. The only thing I'd like for you to do is when you're in a better place, you turn around and help somebody else. So uh, it's a nonprofit and uh, I never had the intention of starting a, a nonprofit. I, I really just wanted to have a storage unit. And I have a very full life. And um, the thing that Blackberry Winter has taught me is what we think is possible is small. That um, when your intention is only to serve others, no benefit to yourself. It's so much bigger than you that you couldn't have told me four years ago we would have furnished almost 500 homes, given 750 kids beds that I would even have the time or the ability or the knowledge to know how to navigate this road. But my intention was just to help other people. So when we first started, I would think, people would ask me for something, and I would think, I just don't even know where to begin on that. It always would happen. It would always happen. And then I decided about a year into it, I was going to quit putting my limitations on it and my thoughts on it and every how blackberry winter grew that felt comfortable and authentic to me i would say yes and so here i sit talking to y'all and you know somewhat of an expert on nonprofits, and and my mind is blown by the goodness of people that how much they want to help and the help we've given has changed lives. I mean, I can call Pizza Hut and order pizza and the person that answers the phone says, you furnished my home for me. Like that, that right there, like that made her life better, you know? Or my mom will talk to someone and they'll say, our granddaughter, your daughter helped our granddaughter. And it, it, it is changing people's lives. That is one benefit of Blackberry Winter, but the other is the goodness of the volunteers and the people who donate. People want to think that we are very divided. I, I don't believe as a culture that we are. I, I think when you see someone hurting, you want to help. And Blackberry Winter provides that avenue in Appalachia to take care of our neighbors. When we didn't, we wanted to help, we didn't know how. I come from a family of servants. Um, all of my family are public servants, and I was raised with foster children. Uh, my mom and dad always kept foster kids. So I always had an acute awareness that my life wasn't the same as other people's lives. And um, I believe that like we all have a thing in our mind that is our thing to help others. And mine always was, it always bothered me 
that like I bought a new refrigerator because I wanted a different color, but I couldn't give my old one to someone else. Like, um, I remember I paid Lowe's $25 to haul mine off. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Like the, you know, they didn't need it at the dump and someone did need it and I didn't know how to give it to them. So I decided that and a few other things happened that I was just going to get a storage unit. I was going to tell all the people, like my friends and family, when you have this, put it in there. When someone's house burns or we hear they need it, then we'll just give it to them. And it took me five years of thinking the thought before I like put action to it and that I was tired of thinking it needed to be done and I needed just to do it. The thing I found when I started Blackberry Winter is like people in the shelter, domestic violence shelter, first of all, they don't go to a shelter if they have anyone else to help them. So they are alone. They can't go to Goodwill or these other places and pay $40 for a couch. So they don't have that access. So to a lot of people, that didn't feel right either. They wanted to give it. So Blackberry Wiener works so well because of that. There's storage units that you can access and you put your used furniture. And I only take good quality, not broken th furniture. Furniture I would have in my home. And not that mine doesn't have a couple stains or whatever, but these people have already went through a lot. I'm not giving them trash. Like, uh, I'm giving them, I want them to feel that their community thinks they're worth it, that they're worthwhile. I think it changes something within them. Like when they come and they see what we give them, you just see something in their eyes like, like this is nice. Thank you, you know? And I tell people, they'll say, well, I'll give you a table, but it needs the leg fixed or, you know, something. I'm like, well, I would love for you to fix the leg and bring it to me. Because the thing is, they are in crisis. They lost their home to fire. They have lost their health to illness. They are sleeping on the floor. Like fixing that table is one more thing. I, I want them to know that like we are trying to help them and we want them to know that we think they're worthwhile. So I try real hard not to limit what I think uh, where Blackberry Winter will go I believe every community can benefit from a Blackberry winner. I believe that the excess meets the need in each community. Uh, this isn't a Appalachia thing. This is a every community thing that you have illness, you have fire, you have elderly that need help, you have addictions, you have imprisonment. So um, I do not like it being portrayed as uh, poor Appalachia and we're helping Appalachians. This, this is a universal truth and I do think every community can benefit from Blackberry Winter. So the only thing that I keep in my mind with Blackberry Winter is um, that we don't I don't care why you need help. We have all needed help. Uh, I think about all the people in my life who have helped me and if I had been made to feel guilty for that help, what it would have done to me. I. I wouldn't be the same person I am here. So we don't, I do not judge why someone needs help. Um, I, also, I also have no expectation of what they do with the help. Uh, I want them to feel seen. I want them to feel worthy. Um, addiction takes many times to beat. And if it takes an average of 10 times and we are the third, they don't get to 10 without three. And I committed when I started this that if we keep one family from burying their kid, that's enough. That's enough. And, and anytime I get tired, I think that thought that, um, that if, if one family gets to keep their kid, then, then I done good, you know? And um, the other thing that I keep focus on is kids need beds. I did not know that kids in our community were sleeping on the floor. I, the first home I went into that came out of the shelter, she worked two jobs in fast food. Um, she had two little girls and there wasn't a blanket in that house. There wasn't a pillow. I just, and I just thought, how would they ever be okay? Like, 
how do they feel like people care about them sleeping on the floor? I'm sorry, that just really, kids deserve a bed. And um, I'm a firm believer that my kids have two pillows on my bed, those kids will have two pillows. And they need warm blankets and a clean place. And no, I can't promise that their parents will keep giving them that bed, or I just hope that for a little while, that what's within my control, that they knew that their community believed that they did not deserve to sleep on the floor. I'm sorry I got to cry. That kills me, though. Take a moment. I got too emotional on that. Well, I had decided that day, like, I would get a second job. That's what my decision was. I would get a second job, and we would not do that. You know, I just... There's been, there's been a few people we've helped that just really st stick in my mind. Uh, others, they kind of just blur together, and you know that you did help them. And I'm terrible with names. I can't ever remember a name. Uh, you know, my husband will be like, did we, like, help them do it? And I'm like, no idea. <laughs> you know, can't ever remember. But anyways, we were helping this family, and uh, they, they had come out of the shelter, and it was pouring the rain. So I had canceled on, with the social worker and told her we need to do it when it's dry. And she said, well, you know, they're in their apartment. Can we at least just just get them something to sleep on? Or So I was like, all right, yeah, we will. And went up there, and it had stopped raining. And there was a, she had a little boy there. And um, we were loading the furniture. And I swear, every piece of furniture we brought out, that little boy, he was like five years old, he would get on the couch and he would say, this is the best couch I've ever seen. I love this couch. This, he made me laugh and feel so happy in my soul. I can think about him being so happy with that couch and then like got his um bed linens and they were like superhero and he was like rolling on the ground with them like so happy <laughs> with that that like it, i think about that different times that when i feel tired and it's raining and i just want to stay home or you know i think about him and just this joy he had on it really was the best couch for him. And it made his whole day so good. And I hope his whole like few weeks or something, you know, and so I think about him a lot. And then another one, we furnished a home for a man came out of prison and it was a few months later and we were doing another home and a gentleman came up to me and he said, um, do you remember me? And I said, I'm sorry. I don't. And he said, you know, you furnished my home when I came out of jail. And um, he said, I want you to know, like, I, I'm working full time now. And he said, I volunteer my time to help people that were like me. And he said, I'll never forget what you did. That, like, I had a bed and I had a skillet and a spoon and a fork. And, and he still is one of our hardest working volunteers. And he was one of the first people we helped. I have to be careful what I ask him because he will hurt himself doing it. And we'll be down at the buildings, like cleaning furniture, uh, lifting things, doing. And I know we changed his life. And now he helps other people. And they can see that it's possible to, to come out, you know, that you aren't your mistakes. That, that you can move forward. And now he can reach people that I never could. I've never been in prison. But like he can speak to them and really show them that like things can get better. M me personally, I am perfectly satisfied with what Blackberry Winter does now. Uh, we help a lot of people and um, I feel proud of what we do and I'm I'm satisfied where it is. I also know that Blackberry Winter is something bigger than me. So I have said it as my intention to let Blackberry Winter grow organically to where uh, it needs to be. And there's been two communities outside of this area who have started a Blackberry Winter. 
to be real honest, it makes me feel um, and prepared for how big it could be. But then I know I can meet that challenge when it shows up because there are there's kids in every community that needs a bed. There, there's people in every community that needs help. So I, I do my best not to limit Blackberry Winter to my own mind and my own energy level or and just have the faith and the belief that it will grow to where it needs to and the people that I need to help me will show up. So I don't see it and think in five years, what do I want Blackberry Winter to be? Um, one goal I have that is an ongoing goal is every child that needs a bed, I can say yes to. And thus far we do, but it becomes harder and harder because I buy the beds. So, you know, I'd like to be a, in a partnership or something that the beds could be donated. That would take a whole lot off of my plate and a lot of worry that I have about that because I, I, I think sometimes people will hear that we give kids beds and then I get scared. They're going to ask me and I'm not going to have it or not have the money. That's never happened though, but it is something that I think about when I'm like in my own mind. And um, so when I think what I would like for Blackberry Winter is that a partnership with um, Seeley or with, you know, something that, that I know like when people ask for beds that are needed, we can just give them. Um, I don't want them to have to um, validate it or whatever. If there's a kid that needs a bed, we'll give it, you know. And um, so that is a dream that I have for it, for Blackberry Winter. But uh, I don't limit to what what it could grow to or what it could do and don't hold it to my own mind of what I have the ability to learn or do. I'll figure it out. That's okay. <laughs> so... Um, working in Maryland as a travel nurse. And I have always lived in Southwest Virginia. This is my first time like living outside of the area. And I, I go back and forth. I'm there a week and I'm here a week. So when I first went up there, uh, they all got a kick out of my accent, which I did not know I had that strong of an accent, but they, they told me it was deep. Like <laughs> that's their favorite thing to say. But, um, so I also didn't realize that I speak in sayings all the time, which when I told my kids, they were like, uh, yeah, yeah, you say stuff all the time. So now uh, they all have in Maryland, they have a running uh, commentary about the things I say. And it goes on in Facebook messages and stuff. But uh, feeling of a patient's stomach who was having a contraction, and I said, that's tight as a banjo string. Um then, like, they wanted a paper towel. I told them I'd get them one, but it was rough as a cob. Slow as Christmas. Um, slow as molasses. Hotter than 40 hells. Uh, like, all these things that just roll off my tongue that I don't even think about. Uh, as useless as tits on a boar hog. Uh, <laughs> and, like, I say these to my kids, and they're like, yes, mother, you say those things all the time. And I was like, it's funny that you just say things you don't even, it's just part of how we talk. We just say stuff, you know, and I think it shows very much what I'm meaning. Like I I said to them, I was uh, busier than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And they said, why don't you just say you're busy? And I said, it's not the same. You understand what I'm saying here is like, I'm like darting some problems and really working hard, you know? And they were like, it's true. It's true, and I don't know why some people in Appalachia, like, speak that way, and others don't. Um, maybe it was where I was raised on the mountain. Um, you know, my mama always had a say in for anything. Like, you know, uh, she'd say, he didn't, don't have the brains that God give a goose, or, you know, uh, like, that's so perfect, or cricket as a dog's hind leg, or, uh, like, you know how crooked that is then when you say that, and um, so I I had, in a way, kind of toned them down a little bit in Maryland, because, uh, you know, there has been some not kind things said, 
But 99% like really enjoy it and it is who I am. It's authentic to me and I don't think I should change the way I speak. Um, like I love hearing the way other people say things and articulate things and I think it is beautiful in Appalachia the way we talk. And I don't want to change it. Well, I think on, well, I know on Jewel Ridge, we were very isolated. Um, like we went to school at George Elementary. We went to church there. We played on our own um, um, ball leagues. So we didn't really um, interact with very many people and it's a small community. So when I came to Richlands to the middle school, I knew 30 people who were my grade that I had went from kindergarten through fifth grade with. And then I came to Richlands and there was like 700 students and I was just so overwhelmed like I do think that it did um, create a stronger accent, like I was talking about. I do think it created a stronger sense of culture. But on the documentary, Shanna Plaster had said, uh, they had asked her, what did she think my superpower was, uh, talking about me? And she said, I think all the people from Jewel Ridge superpower was that they were from Jewel Ridge. That, um, that they had a sense of community that she said she had never seen anywhere that she had lived. And if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And that really was the way we lived. And I, if I could give every kid that upbringing, I would. I mean, we were safe. We were protected. We weren't coddled. We weren't spoiled. Um, but we were given just a good work ethic, good moral code, and, and the freedom just to be children. And you know, even kids in town didn't have the same experience. I mean, they had simu similar in that, like they were allowed within this area to be or whatever, but um, my mama was one of 18 and my papa was one of nine or 10 and that was one set of grandparents. Everyone up there knew me and knew me well. Most of them were related to me. And they did not care at all to stop me from doing whatever I was doing or like we were all everybody's kids in the safest way. Like and we never had concerns. Um, now I know as an adult that my mom and dad did have concerns over some people. But they never, um, they just always protected me from that. And I never had to be aware of that. that um, and I wish that every kid could have that freedom to just uh, not have to worry, you know? Um, like as a, even before all this was a, a thing, my family, it was a thing. I was allowed to have an opinion, you know? And I have a shirt of me in fifth grade and it says, who needs looks, I've got brains. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I looked at that shirt and I'm like, mom. And she said, it's the truth. Like, you, you always were just so smart, you know, and just like, I like didn't even know that I was being indoctrinated into this, you know, but here I am. So <laughs> it was the best, you know. I don't even know that I knew that shirt said that. I don't, I saw the picture and I wore it all the time, you know, but um, I think that's awesome though that she put that shirt on me in like 1978. <laughs> you know, uh, that it really created within me that, like, I know who I am and uh, my appearance or anything like that has nothing to do with who I am, right? And that I was allowed to say my truth and it not be judged. And the other thing my parents done so well is um, I'm moderately, I don't know how you... I mean, as a kid, they told me I was moderately dyslexic. So I had a real hard time learning to read. And um, mom just really, really educated herself about this. And I can remember being nine or 10 years old and her telling me, we went and watched E.T. and her telling me Steven Spielberg was dyslexic. And she said, you see things differently and you have to learn things differently but you are different. So like not as a bad thing as a good thing. And I think it has helped me create Blackberry Winter. Um, I can take a test and pass it on anything. I read uh, one to three books a week. Um, 
it didn't define me as like I am not intelligent. Uh, I have intelligence that is maybe different than other people's. But I think it is one of the greatest things about me, you know, that I can see things from a different perspective and that I had to work hard to be able to read and to learn some things and then other things I just know, you know, it's just a difference. And that was really embraced and accepted and not like a disability. I always knew like that my mom and my aunts and stuff always wanted my opinion on something because it was different. And I still am that way. Like if someone is saying something, I can get to the core of it real fast. Like, like, so what makes you feel that way? Or like realize they're speaking out of hurt or they are feeling um, unseen or like very quickly, people's intention is very clear to me very fast. Um, it's hard to trick me or fool me. And people will say, you know, they're lying to you, Terry. And I'm like, I know. You know, I don't take it personally, but I, I know. And that's a, that is a good thing that, that, that they did for me. You know, my grandmother on my Crawford side obviously was. We didn't know it. And um, she could quote um, chapters, chapters yeah. Yeah. of the Bible. And... Like right now, I could quote to you the Gettysburg Address, my favorite poems, I have a dream speech. Like, but I can remember my mama um, writing on her table, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, patterns within the Bible. Numbers. I see everything that way in patterns. Like, um, and that's the reason I can pass any test is because I can recognize the pattern of the correct answer. Like, I don't know the answer. That's wild. I can see the answer, okay? But my mama, my, both my mamas made quilts. And the one who was dyslexic made artwork. Hers was just, I mean, still I can look at it in how um, detailed and tied in even the stitches she made on different pieces of the pattern. It is artwork. My other mama made things you slept under, do you know? And just as good a skill you needed, but I, I recognize myself in my mama that had dyslexia in that like um, I can create very beautiful things in different ways, thus living in an old church, or, you know, the things that I think are beautiful aren't like typical. But I also love the patterns of leaves on the trees. I love knowing what the trees are. I love uh, anything in nature like that, that you can see the, um, the patterns in the behavior, you know, or in that I think most people don't ever view. Uh, my husband thinks it's hilarious that I collect rocks. I love rocks. I stop on the side of the road and get rocks all the time. Because I think they're like the different color variation and how it makes it with the water flowing over it. And my whole driveway is just a whole slew of rocks that I love, you know. And I had my whole car full of rocks yesterday. That's what I did. Uh, and he, like he just looked like, okay, you know, he's give up on like we're going to pave the driveway because we're not. <laughs> we are not going to pave the driveway, you know. We're going to collect rocks and they're going to be beautiful and it's going to be good. So... <laughs> Y'all have to come see it one day. <laughs> well, I obviously care deeply about the people of Appalachia and um, believe in the inherent goodness of them. And the work ethic here is, is I don't think you find it in very many places, how hard people will work to help their families and to help one another. Appalachia is a place who, that doesn't like change and uh, can get very deeply rooted in thought processes that no longer serve us. But one thing I can say though is, is once they see another side, they're also willing to change their mind. Uh, you just have to present it in a way that they see value in what you're saying. Um, Appalachians aren't inherently confrontational. Um, they're gonna believe what they believe and just go about their way. <laughs> So you're not going to know that they do not agree with you, you know. But when you show value in a new 
thought process. They are very open to that. And the Appalachian culture is so rich and so uh, complex that when you study about Appalachia, we're one of the last areas that has maintained our accent and our culture and things from not having a lot of outside influences. Um, other parts of the South uh, have lost a lot of their accent, have lost a lot of their ways. And uh, here we are very uh, committed to maintaining gardening, maintaining um, air music, air belief in, in God and churches. And uh, I'm committed to like the skills I was taught as a child, like canning, food and that kind of thing, like maintaining that because it is something that is beautiful in our area. And Appalachians are so fiercely protective over their families, like family is everything. And when you leave the area and you see cultures that aren't rooted in family like that, you see people just spinning out in the universe, not knowing where they belong or trying to find their way. When, I mean, what I was raised in in Appalachia was my way was me. I was accepted exactly like I was. And I see that in our area. Um, people think that we can be judgmental, I think. I don't see that. Like, you see mama and papa's at the grocery store and a purple-haired boy with his nails painted or whatever, and they're just chatting it up with him and, you know, just enjoying life, you know. And... I don't think the outside areas see that part of us. And, and you know, even living in Maryland, they said to me, um, you know, have you had a lot of experience with racism and things, you know, where you're from? And uh, truthfully, I've never seen it. I'm not saying that it's not here, but I have seen it in Maryland. Saw, you know, like just like significant racism. So I, I'm not saying that we're better or worse, but I think a lot of the um, ways that people believe we are or think of us is incorrect. We're very intelligent people who can make our own way and who are accepting and loving and, um, and really, really devoted to our families. I think a lot of us try to find who we are and our purpose and inside of our own selves. And... You, you never find it in service to yourself. You always find your purpose in serving others. And if you've ever been the giver of a great gift, the joy of giving that gift is so much more than receiving a great gift. And it is the same way. People who are struggling to find their purpose or where they belong, they have something in their mind that they know they need to be doing for others. You can't build your bank account big enough. You can't have enough to give you the feeling that you have when you know you've helped someone else. And, and there's a balance in that. You can give until you give all of yourself away. And that isn't what I'm talking about. Like, do the work to be your best self and then use your life to serve others. In that, you will always find your purpose and you'll always find your contentment. Um, I had a lady, it's a hairdresser, and she was like, I just want to be able to help women come in out of the shelter. And I said, that's your thing. That's your thing. One hour a week, do that. Like, everyone has that thing. Or a fellow we helped, and he said, you know, the trash on the side of the road just bothers me. It always bothers me. I'm like, pick it up. Pick it up. That's your thing. You know, like, we all have that thing that you just think, and it's not, it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing, you know, but once that you know that you are fulfilling that and using your life to serve, when it seems like all the other things just line up for you, that you're not struggling so hardcore trying to find your place in the universe, that is your place, you found it. Mm -hmm.